Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because the, the thing we need now are um, words and deeds that can inspire us and uh, what the, the activism and, and the, um, the, the message that um, Congressman Lewis and, uh, and so many like him have tried to just keep moving forward is it, it can it can and should be an inspiration. Um, uh, interestingly, the exhibition um, uh, "Landscape Awe to Activism" has a very strong orientation to environmental activism, um, awe of nature uh, and concern for the planet. Um, it seems to me that this moment that we're in with so many other issues and the activism that has been ignited around um, racial injustice um, and um, certainly um, women's issues and uh, the economy and inequality and all of these things. Um, it seems that it's hard to separate them all into individual categories because they're all connected together as we are human beings living on this planet. And so there's impact in many different directions. And so what has really, um, what I, did, I've, I have admired about your work and your career is that you have found a path and you've found a voice about making creative um, your, your creative, uh, uh, you know, process, but it, it's also about a uh, concern, a uh, love um, of nature and the environment. So could you maybe go back and um, just very quickly uh, tell us about your, your path, your personal and professional path that got you to where you are now? Well, Jeff, I was hoping you would ask. <laughs> it just so happens that I've got this slideshow uh, here that I put together that um, tries to do that. So I'm, I'm going to show some slides. Um, and it's a funny thing uh, when you're an artist and you're fortunate enough to have some moments in your life where you get to participate in something like this and you're asked to look back and uh, you know gather a sampling of your work and present it in a way that is perhaps coherent. And uh, it's a sort of a writing and a rewriting of history. And I think a lot of artists feel that way. There's a kind of um, search for the true, what is the, what is the true bundle of threads that runs through your life and and is there a sense to it and and um is it all adding up to something or not <laughs> and um i i find myself wondering that and uh and trying to put together streams of images that make some kind of sense um but then thinking it's it's i think more uh, up to you than up to me so i'm going to share some images for about uh a little less than 10 minutes. I'm starting with this painting, which is, this is just a, a studio photograph on my iPhone, actually, of a painting I just finished. But it's the most sort of current thing that I'm doing. And one of the things that I wonder, looking back 25 years, is how, how did I come to this? And I feel that there are, in fact, um, there is a kind of a constellation of concerns and interests that have conspired to bring me to this place of, of just painting these big oak trees. And these are, these are um, four by six foot paintings, as opposed to most of the landscape painting I've done in my life, which is much smaller. And so um, going back from here, uh, there was the years of study of classical painting and years in Italy and afterwards, painting directly from life in a kind of an Italianate style using this ancient site size method and always feeling a certain kind of tension between the um, indoctrination I received in, in the small private studio in Italy and my interest in contemporary concerns and being part of the contemporary world. 
And so I think a lot of these paintings have a, a kind of a mystery or kind of an unknowingness about them as much as they are still very much just kind of representational, um, almost kind of Renaissance in their technique. And then I moved to the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, which is this um, community and center uh, that in West Sonoma County, where um, a group of friends and I uh, founded this nonprofit and also intentional community. And it's a very beautiful piece of um, 80 acre uh, piece of land that we've come into deep relationship with over the years. And we've shared through our programs with hundreds of people who've come in and um, made their contribution of work or, or, or good energy. And um, it's, a, it's a kind of a, um, a refuge and in some ways a sanctuary in my mind. And this is just a view from the kitchen there are a lot of things there to paint. And the experience of painting there and really becoming involved in landscape painting for the very first time after living an urban life, my whole life up till this time, um, I, I really felt that the painting was an expression of love. And it was a kind of uh, way to give evidence to this, this human experience of, of just reverence and love of place. And, um, and another thing about OEC is there's this uh, beautiful dance between the cultivated and the wild. And you've always got this sense that the cultivated elements like these apple trees in front of this wall of oak woodland, um, the cultivated elements are, are part of a greater balance. And that's one of the things that sustainable agriculture aspires to. And um, it's something that, that these paintings speak of, but in a very, in a very quiet way, in a very subtle way. Uh, you know, you talk about activism. My work has never been overtly activist in the sense that it's, uh, you know, like a poster that's trying to motivate you to do a certain thing uh, or, or to think a certain thing. But I think that a set of values are inherent in the work that um, are spoken by the work. And in some cases, those values are radical uh, or even subversive in the face of another kind of paradigm that might be dominant. So painting at OEC and painting small landscapes was really where my head was at for quite a long time. And uh, and yet, a lot of representational painting ends up leading to uh, abstraction. And I did, I did start this kind of dance, which became a breathing, a, a, a breathing back and forth between abstraction and representation. And and as they went back and forth, they became more and more like one another, which is kind of interesting to look at in in retrospect. These large abstract paintings, these are four by five foot paintings, were um, for me not really abstract. They were almost more portraits of um, natural processes or almost like energy events. And, um, and the abstract painting always led me back to the landscape. Uh, I remember I, I got an ice cream cone in front of the um, post office in Bodega Bay when I was painting these abstract paintings and I was, I, I looked across the, the mud flats and I thought, wow, that's, that's so abstract. There's just this bay and the sky and this strip of land and these trees. And there's this constant roiling movement either in the sky or in the, in the bay or with the trees being blown in the wind and it's, there's this tension between the sort of uh, linearity of it and the, um, the dy dynamic quality that it had. And I started my first series um, realizing that rather than searching for something to paint, I could just stay very still and the subject would continue to change before me. And I, I, I'm selecting a few of these. I did about 45 of these. And 
had the first real experience of a, a large series of work, which became something that um, I, I continue to do because it, it really works for me for a variety of reasons. Hey, Adam, um, about when did you start doing that series? Uh, 2006. Okay. And so, I, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, um, what, was there any particular influence that um, in, perhaps uh, motivated you or inspired you to move from uh, realism into abstract work and, and back? Were you looking at any particular other artists or was there anything that um, happened um, to, yeah. to move you in that direction? I think it grew out of the process itself. I was certainly aware of artists like Deben Korn who abstracted the landscape and there, there are a lot of examples of that because the landscape just lends itself to abstraction. It really does. And, and as a painter building landscape paintings, there's always, a, I shouldn't ever say always, there's, there's almost always, in my experience, a moment where you're looking at an abstract painting and then you move that into representation. Uh, and, and sometimes it happens the other way. Uh, the farther you push representation, the, the, you t sort of tumble into abstraction on the other side. So um, there, it seems natural, you know, that that, that boundary is traversed over, over time. And I think maybe it's even common, I'm not sure. You would know better than I, uh, how often that happens. Um, it, 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 it happens. <laughs> It, um, uh, probably not as frequently with other artists as it does with you, but, um, but yeah, there, there, there are good examples. So, um, the other kind of, um, thread that has run through the years is this multi panel, uh, configuration, which for me, I think is, is really about, um, narrative and my interest in story and storytelling and meaning. And if you show somebody an image, they will generate, usually they'll generate some meaning. That meaning could come out of their own experience. Uh, you know, that, that looks like a ball I had when I was a kid or, or, or something of that nature, or that meaning could be contextual. But when you show somebody two or three images or four images, the meaning is uh, much more complex and you start getting these really interesting narratives. I mean, I think they're interesting um, and making up these stories. If you show somebody a, a storyboard, they'll, they'll tell you the story. And one of the other things about these multi image images or collections of images is the way they um, invite stylistic variation and the, the tension between different styles of painting within the same work, uh, it generates a certain kind of energy and, and interest. Um, it, it almost like it's when you push the difference, uh, they, each, each thing becomes more itself. So these, these paintings have been an ongoing engagement, whether triptychs or diptychs or these sextets. And, um, and they continue to be also sort of a laboratory where uh, these, these different ideas that are played out in the bigger paintings can, can be born and I can kind of iterate them. Before I, I went into the, the, my last big series, which was the Pond series, I did another round of these large abstractions that I called premonitions. But this time they were much more kind of hybrid between abstract and representational. The, the space was more representational, the light was more palpable. Uh, there was a kind of um, almost a microcosm, macrocosm thing going on. You know, some people said, oh, that looks like a Hubble telescope painting uh, uh, image or something you'd see in a microscope. And I think my, my real, core interest is, is in light and the way it animates the forces of nature. And that um, I was trying to paint that without the object, without the 
specific thing like a tree. Uh, and I'm not sure why, but um, that's what I was doing for, for a few years. It was never fully satisfying to me and I always went back to nature. And I think that um, these oak trees, which I feel so much affection for, and those of us who are familiar with Sonoma County know how they've been dying uh, from sudden oak death. Uh, it, and, and it's been a real terrible, um, very difficult thing to watch. Um, a lot of the biggest ones on our land have, have died in the, in the last 15 years, after living for hundreds of years. Um, I didn't feel quite ready to make a full commitment to these trees. And uh, so instead I started just painting this, this humble little golden willow in the corner of our pond. And um, I just kept going back to it and painting it. And after I had painted six or seven of these paintings, I thought, what would it be like if I just spent a year sitting here uh, painting that tree every day and just watching the seasons change and, and coming into relationship with this tree. And that's what I, I decided to do and ended up with 70 of these paintings. So they took about two weeks, um, morning, noon, and night. So each, each couple of weeks, I had three of them. And, um, and did this series, which at first was a series of individual paintings, but at the end of, of, the, of the effort, it, it turned out to really be one work of art that I called the Pond Series. And I kept all 70 paintings together and they ended up being installed in a hospital, um, in a waiting area of a hospital where um, people sit and wait and probably think a lot about time and where they've been and the meaning of, of it all and watching it all go by. And so um, that sort of set me up for a real bigger commitment to bigger relationships. Um, and I started painting these large paintings of these oak trees, which is what I've been doing now for the last three years. I'm working on the uh, 16th one. And um, they're really like portraits as much as they are landscapes. Um, the, the trees themselves become um, like friends, uh, like teachers for me. And it, it, the relationship is like a student teacher relationship in that the more you give yourself over to a tree, the more still you become and the more present you become. Uh, in my experience, the more the tree gives to you. Just the way trees give so much to so many uh, creatures and uh, other plants. And there's, there's this kind of uh, available relationship there that um, in some ways these, these paintings are a portrait of. So they're just not the tree, but they're the relationship uh, with the tree. And we might um, talk about that a little more. Um, but another thing that these trees are coming more and more to represent for me is, is a set of values. And in this Trumpian era with all of these uh, values of um, exploitation and, and greed and um, selfishness and exclusion, they really are, the tree's values really are the opposite suite. Um, you know, the tree is so committed to community and they even share resources with each other and they clean the air and give shelter and nourishment and um, life and they're beautiful. Um, and it's no surprise that uh, cross-culturally trees uh, symbolize all of those things and, and more. Um, and of course, trees also symbolize scary things and, um, and it's part of the whole full circle of life. Uh, but for me, the, the values that the tree speaks uh, are, the, are the ones that we most need to hold to these days. Um, so in that way, the images 
I wouldn't go as far as saying they're activists, but they are pushing back on perhaps the the most distressing part of the what for some are the dominant values or the dominant paradigm that's that's being foisted on us. So since COVID started, uh, I've done two paintings. Uh, this one, which is uh, a, yet again, the tree in front of our kitchen, uh, a tree I've painted many times, but painted again from this new angle. And, uh, and this one that I'm sitting in front of. And uh, that brings us to the present. So I'll stop sharing my screen there. Great. Well, um, thank you so much for that overview, uh, Adam. And um, one thing I was just uh, thinking about is that the, uh, the painting that is in our current exhibition, and it's, it, it, it's just a majestic, large, um, dominant in a, to a certain degree uh, painting in that particular section of the gallery. Um, I think that that tree in particular, uh, just to me, uh, it, it just, um, it illustrated the power um, and the timelessness of the, the Oak series. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about um, how, you know, how, how these trees, um, what, what presence and, and impact and meaning they have in your life and, and why that series um, continues? I think that I think the meaning and the power they have in my life is is they they really do uh, it's kind of what I was just saying they really do stand for what I hold in 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 highest esteem um, I mean a, a great tree is just a really a miraculous thing and so many things about these trees we we still don't understand and a lot of the the books that have been out lately um, <clears throat> dabble in the biology of trees and the way they communicate with each other and um, the way that they affect the environment. And, and to be sure, sometimes trees do um, poison the soil for other plants and, you know, do things that are uh, competitive and um, it's not all uh, butterflies and rainbows, but there is a sense that uh, whatever they're doing, um, there's a kind of intelligence operating there, which is so transcends what happens when humans form societies. And it's so inspiring in that regard, because um, when you're part of the human society, it's, it's often difficult to believe that there's some kind of greater intelligence, um, not not to diss humans, but it doesn't feel to me these days like there's a great deal of inspiration to be found in the way humans organize themselves, and yet every forest is a great, a, a vast organized society of 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 trees, and and then some, you know, and then all of the mycorrhizal. Uh, dimensions and 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 um, the fungus and the creatures it's really just astonishing so it's a deep well of, of inspiration and it's a, a deep well of wisdom and um, and then the other thing is the emotional dimension you know it's it's been proven <clears throat> empirically that uh, people heal faster if they have a tree to look at outside their hospital window there's there's been a lot of work on healing and trees and and we all know that because we've all had a hectic day in a city and found found a little park and even a very little park uh, can give you this respite uh, which I I imagine most people don't think much about but if you really think well why am I feeling better right now it's the uh, powerful influence of this of this being uh, on on your field of of energy and consciousness and 
it's a it's a remarkable thing to be part of and so you say why does the series go on i mean i think i think it it's i've found a practice which is both um kind of fully self justifying even if there was no work of art at the end but then it's also the practice of making paintings which then go into the world and have this other this other world this other life interesting so you, you've talked really about practice and meaning and in um, other conversations you and I've had you've also really um, dug into technique and um, that's something we haven't really talked about other than your own perhaps your 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 discipline in terms of technique um, for example choosing to paint the same tree at the pond um, o over an entire year uh, in fact um, we should mention here there you you made a, a really wonderful uh, short video um, two-minute video about those pond paintings uh, that pond series and uh, I think we have uh, the link for that and a link to your website that we can put in the chat function. So after this uh, program, if people want to go to um, to check out that video, I think that would really be um, really meaningful for, for everybody here. But um, let, let's just talk about your technique, um, which uh, I've been incredible. I was trained as a, a painter before I became a curator. and. So I always look at technique and uh, with a certain amount of um, admiration for what uh, a, a skilled, uh, a highly experienced skilled painter uh, might bring to the work. Um, so uh, clearly the technique is different in the Oaks than it might be from the Bodega um, Bay or the, um, or, or the Pond series. Um, you know, tell us a, a bit about that. Um, sure. Well, I know there are a lot of artists out there in the in the boxes, and <laughs> one of the <clears throat> one of the things that's uh, I, th I think always on the mind of a painter is the the question of seeing the forest versus seeing the trees. You know, seeing the the particular versus the kind of gestalt of the whole, and how detailed do you need to get? I think a lot of painters and probably I'm in this in this bucket would say um, you don't want to be more detailed than you have to be and so you know some teachers say well use larger brushes and keep yourself out of the tiny little 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 picking and poking and and sometimes too much detail can really take an image apart and um, be its downfall but there's this paradox because these trees are a collection of extraordinary tiny little structures and they are kind of fractal like the more you go into them you you try to sort of get into something like the bark or 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 part of the moss and you think you can sum it up and right when you feel you can make a general statement with a broad stroke a whole other world opens up and there's this desire I feel to follow follow and and go deeper and deeper into these these little worlds these inner worlds which can be very um, which can lead you into a lot of detail which is then uh, has has its other problems so this whole struggle around broad the broad versus the specific is a big part of the technique and I look forward to the day when I know, I had to do that. <laughs> if any of you know how to do that, please write me and tell me because uh, I feel like every single painting is that struggle. And almost every single time, I hope to be more broad than I end up in the end. So that's part of the technical thing. The other big technical thing always is um, the consistency of the surface across the canvas. And uh, one of the hallmarks of a, um, an amateur painting is when you get right up to it and you look especially at light reflected on it, uh, the surface is, is very inconsistent. And um, the 
refraction and refle reflection um, coefficients in different parts of the painting are different. And sometimes you can kind of take care of that with just a coat of varnish. Uh, but I think um, while, while I'm painting, I need to keep the values um, true to what they'll be at the end of the painting. And I, and I do that with a medium that I've developed um, or come to use over the last 30 years. And it's finally really working. Um, and of course, I can't tell you what it is. That, uh, that's, the, that's the secret sauce you can't talk about, right? Yeah, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't possibly talk about that. Now I can talk about that. Um, I use uh, I use this um, stuff called Galkid Slow Dry, which is uh, poppy oil and um, alkyl alkyl alkyd resin, and it's made by Gamblin. And I, I love the idea of having poppy oil in my painting. And then um, and then I use beeswax which is uh, in, a, in a cold wax preparation, which this is um, also by Gamblin, and you can use this cold. It's not like the kind of wax you have to melt. And if you mix the wax and the slow dry galkid, at just the perfect proportion, uh, then you can get a surface that isn't too brittle it's not too reflective, but it's lustrous, and you can actually buff it up a little bit, like a wax surface. You could, and um, and it's actually working pretty well now. So so so, the medium is a technical thing that's working, but the uh, approach to detail, I'm I'm definitely struggling with. The last thing I'll say about technique is taking these four by six paintings out into the field, is is harder than the little ones. Uh, the wind blows and the sun changes and the easel breaks and um, and so that's uh, it would be good to have a studio with a bunch of oak trees right outside the front door. <laughs> um, but I don't. Well, as, I've been to your studio and I know you're sitting in your studio now. Um, you are um, in a beautiful natural environment and with um, there there are trees all, all around the studio perhaps not the oaks that you want to paint necessarily but um, I think it'd be really kind of fun for the the um, people here uh, who've uh, signed in for this particular program if you wouldn't mind just uh, this is a, a little bit uh, informal but um, maybe just the briefest of tours of your space all right um, and if, if people want to uh, make sure you're on speaker view, um, you can see, uh, see Adam better if you're, you get out of gallery view. All right, well, we go outside. Is this actually working? Um, yeah, so this far. Is, this is the orchard. Just uh, move, move, move a little bit slower. There's a there's an old orchard over here. There's some scotch broom that was just pulled out, and uh, there's um, very old apple trees and some oak trees, and um, it's a lovely spot. And then there's a pretty large forest behind. And then you come in front door. This room um, has some of these paintings I was just talking about. And um, this is where I paint mostly. There's some Bodega Bay paintings down there. And there's a skylight kind of thing up there right above this wall. So it gets good north light all day. And there's another room here, which has kind of stacks of old stuff and um, some little landscapes and uh, staircase up to a little loft yeah so it's it's a it's a um, great place to work and uh, i was able to build this studio it's it's very 
simple little building on a concrete slab. It's basically a bunch, but um, it's configured in a way that's serving the work really well. And it's right uh, across the street from OAC. Some of you have been there. Indeed. Um, maybe before we um, get to some uh, uh, questions from the audience, um, can you just say a few words about uh, the Art and Ecology Center and um, what, what, what might be going on now, um, maybe even in the midst of the pandemic? Uh, yeah, so um, the, the Art and Ecology Center and my dear old collaborator Dave Henson is here, uh, the ED of the Art and Ecology Center, um, uh, is an 80 acre site, uh, again, West Sonoma County, it's right outside of the town of Occidental. And um, it's, it's a very diverse project, it has a lot of different elements and I, I won't describe them all, but um, in short, there's, there's, there's ele there are uh, efforts that have to do with the site itself. Uh, we're doing restoration in the back country. Um, about, about 10 acres of the 80 acres is developed and about 70 is, is not. And we're doing a lot of restoration work um, out in the, the back country, which we call the grandmother garden. Uh, in the developed section, we've got a, an organic farm um, with uh, seed, uh, seed saving going on in, in, the, um, in the garden. There's a, about a 3,000 variety uh, seed bank that we're curating, and we grow these seeds out year after year, and um, they supply our beautiful organic nursery, which is on Coleman Valley Road. You can read all about this at the website, which is www.oaec.org. We have uh, something called the Water Institute, uh, which works with um, water policy and also uh, runs the California Beaver Campaign. We do on-site courses in permaculture. Um, we have an uh, intentional community of folks who live there and a intern program and we're also doing a lot of gatherings and convenings kind of at the intersection of social justice and ecological activism um, for a lot of bay area groups and and larger groups from even around the world in a new facility that that we just finished that um can it can accommodate up to 50 people in the meeting room so it's a it's a multi multi-headed, uh, diverse project. And I hope you'll uh, read about it. And um, you could visit our nursery, which is, which is not closed, but everything else is closed. And with COVID, of course, gatherings are not uh, okay. So uh, we're waiting with all the other retreat centers in the world to see what happens. And uh, we don't know what that will be. Okay, well, thanks, Adam. Um, what we do, we have some um, questions in the chat, uh, John, I'm actually able to, uh, to, to read them. So um, I, I can uh, just jump on in. Um, we do have a question from um, M. Lanson. Um, uh, trees seem to exist in a longer, slower time frame. Your paintings of these majestic trees often require months to create. Everything seems to be saturated with a deep, profound, and delineated time. How important is this time quality in the paintings? Is this time quality a component of the viewing experience that you hope to manifest? Wow. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, this is Mark Lancet, who was my first TA when I took my first uh, art class in college. And um, he asked me some very hard questions back then. He's still at it. <laughs> Great to see you. Yeah, I think there. Um, I think there's a really interesting point there. Um, I'm not sure what the answer to that question is, but I know that this issue of time and the possibility of painting time into a painting is uh, is real and. 
you know, this is discussed quite a bit in relationship to Vermeer and um, many of his paintings have this uh, extraordinary sense of um, almost uh, encapsulated time, which, is, which has been sort of captured and, and, and is present inside the painting. I, I like that idea. I would like the I would like the tree paintings to have that. I'm not sure how to think about that from a um, impl implementation point of view, but it's a, it's a cool question, Mark. If you want to unmute and um, and say something more about that, uh, please do. So yeah, I I was just. Looking at your paintings, I find that they continue to reward me as I look more and more at them. Um, when I saw the show down in San Luis Obispo, I was struck by the feeling that um, that they were worthy of spending more time than the museum was open. And I think that comes in part from the time you spend capturing the image, but I think it also comes from the quality of time that a tree manifests and i was interested how much of that is in your own creative thinking and process yeah thanks for that it's interesting think about that we'll talk later mark thank you very much for that question um adam you're going to have to read the uh, chat uh section because there are many many compliments and <laughs> you've got a fan uh, a fan club without without a doubt, but they're not necessarily questions. Um, but I do get to another question. Um, and this is, um, you are so articulate about your art, your values and your process. I wonder what it's like for you in the moment while you are painting, looking, feeling, repeat. Are these values conscious or unconscious? Can you describe the experience? I guess in the moment, the, um the, the work of, of the art is, uh, is not so conscious. I'm not sure about unconscious, but I definitely am involved in the practice um, in a way that isn't so much caught up in thinking. In fact, sometimes I can even benefit from listening to uh, a book on tape or, or, or sometimes, uh, you know, a podcast and get my mind engaged in something while I really dive deeply into the painting. Sometimes that, that doesn't work. Uh, but mostly since November, I've been listening to traditional Japanese music when I paint almost all the time. And it's, just been an extraordinary way to focus my mind and reduce the chatter. Um, and certainly, you know, the judgments or the, um, you know, the tough questions, all of that comes later. And then later, there's a lot of that. And I find myself thinking about stuff a lot. Um, but while I'm doing it, I, I think it's more, when it's working, it's more of a kind of, immersive um, immersive thing. And when it's really good, it's almost like that thing that athletes talk about, they talk about the zone. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, and that, that question uh, was from J.S. Sadi. I, 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 if you want to uh, unmute yourself and uh, add or comment, um, we have a small, smaller group here than we might have had otherwise. So, um, but you have to unmute yourself if you want to say something. There you are. Hi, Adam. Uh, it was Don's question, but Jill approved. <laughs> <laughs> we we miss you. We love you. Uh, Jill's already wishing she had some of those paintings, as am I. <laughs> and uh, the the pond series, the oaks. Everything, it's, it's really wonderful to see you. Great to see you too, as well. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, okay, and uh, next question uh, is from Lori. 
who asks, when you're doing your multi-image works, how much do you rearrange the images? Does the order in which you place them change or affect the meeting? I rearrange them a lot. And then when they are in the right arrangement, it's, it's actually a physical feeling more than a, an idea. There's just kind of this sense of, it's almost maybe like um, people who do flower arrangement, when they, they put the bright thing in the right place, it feels right, feels good. Um, so it's sort of like that. And, and I think like maybe a lot of uh, art is like this. Um, a lot of the thinking about it, which is part of the whole, um, comes after you do it. You know, you do something and then you really ponder it. And, um, and, and, then, and then it might be a repeat and repeat. And that cycle goes around. But with the uh, multi-panel, multi-images, um, they kind of, uh, they just feel right at a certain, at a certain point. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Adam, and thank you, Michelle, for that question. Maybe I uh, could ask uh, you a question, Jeff. Sure. I'm, I'm curious, as a curator, um, how engaged you are when you, um, you know, choose work and uh, find it powerful. Um, how much do you care about what the artist thought it meant? Is, is it important, is it, can somebody make powerful political work without really intending to, or is the artist's overt rational intention an important thing for you as a curator? Generally speaking, if I'm curating an exhibition where, um, where there is a topic, if there is a, a concern about a particular issue, uh, in this case uh, might be the environment, um, but I've certainly put uh, curated shows that were more about, um, let's say, uh, other issues of social justice, socio-political uh, issues. I, I do care about what the artist is saying with their work and their intent. A lot of times what leads me to work or um, or actually also with the help of assistants and uh, other curators and people who might help me research an exhibition. Um, in fact, I'll give a shout out to my wife, Connie Tell, who is, uh, is here. Thank you, Connie, for um, actually your help in um, the research on this particular show. The, the intent is important, but um, there are times when um, I'll certainly see work that it seems to have a power and a meaning to me, but I haven't read what the artist says about it. I haven't um, actually spoken with the artist, visited the studio, um, read a review elsewhere in the work, and then uh, it becomes an exploration um, for me to discover whether the work really relates to the theme of the show or not. I've certainly put together exhibitions that were more about materials, about process. Um, uh, I've been interested in abstract art making um, and, uh, and uh, art, the relationship of art to music. I, I think it's interesting uh, to hear what music you're, you're listening to, Adam. Um, a few years ago, I, I put together an abstract exhibition uh, based on mostly jazz that uh, the artists were, were listening to. So it really depends. It, every, every exhibition is, is different. And um, if I'm putting together a, a show on abstraction and I'm interested in what the artist is listening to, if they aren't listening to music when they're making the, sh the work, it can't go in the show. There's no story there. <laughs> anyway, um, we have... Um, Time for maybe one or two. That's, I think there's two more questions here. So th this is, uh, we're going to ask these two questions that are in the chat, and then we're going to wrap it up. So um, uh, let's see, Michelle asks, if there are oaks that are the subjects of your paintings not growing on OAE 
PC, where are the sites that have inspired your Oak series? Yeah, um, most of them are really nearby. They're either on the OAC um, land or they're in some cases on adjacent lands that I've gotten permission to go to. Um, in a few cases, I've kind of gone far afield. The, the big oak that's in the museum show right now is on Ferguson Road, which is about 10 minutes of drive away. Um, and then um, I've gone up north of Healdsburg a couple of times, and there are a couple of trees up there that I painted. But as the series goes on, I'm definitely finding the, um, it's very important to be able to visit the tree and, re and really sit there with the tree. And having a long drive is in increasingly difficult. And so I'm, I'm repainting some of the trees, as you may have noticed, and um, feel like it's better to do a new painting of an old tree that I've already painted and just go deeper than go f searching for something far and wide. Um, Although I just uh, drove up Highway 5, and as you, you come out of the Bay Area and you start heading south on 5, there's, there's a little place called Newman. Anybody know Newman? Show of hands. Newman. Yep, Mark knows. Uh, there is a little a ravine of oak trees there that must have been, I mean, the whole Central Valley probably had oak trees once. Uh, but they are absolutely amazing. And I would kind of like to go and paint those trees, honestly. But everything about the place is rather unsavory other than those trees. So hmm. what are you going to do? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for that question. Uh, let's see, Sharon asks, um, there is so much movement contained in these images. How do you work with the movement in your subject and the movement you experience within yourself? Well, that's asked by a, by a movement guru. <laughs> 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 and um, I know something about a practice called continuum. And I, I'd actually love to hear from you, Sharon, directly about your thoughts about the movement within that a painting could inspire. Because I often feel when I look at these trees for a long period of time, uh, they have a, the image that comes to me most is, is images I got from skin diving of looking at seaweed under water and the, these, these tentacle-like branches that's, that sway and move. And that happens over dozens or maybe even hundreds of years in some cases, but, but obviously they are moving. Uh, there's just another scale of movement. But I wonder if, you, uh, if you've ever had um, part, a part of your practice be actually feeling the inner movement inspired by an image. I don't know if you wanna unmute and say something about that, but it'd be nice to hear your voice. I wasn't expecting to answer a question. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, when you tune into movement, you can feel it anywhere and you can feel it everywhere. And I think the question that I'm really asking you is because, you know, a painting is, is set, right? We think of it as being set, or like this image is set. And yet when I look at these images and I look at the, the vortex, you know, series, those abstracts, there's so much movement and then I can see that that same sense of movement in this painting that's behind you. And so like, I guess what I'm asking is what is the relationship between um, like when you're setting something that's alive? Right. Yeah, so I think one of the most extraordinary things about painting that's representational uh, is that there's this inherent paradox. It's a, it's a still thing. You're capturing something and making it still. But if you're really capturing something truthfully, it's dynamic. You're capturing the dynamic nature of nature because that's the nature of nature and it's not still. And I think where I go with that is that the, 
um, the language of movement is pattern. Mm -hmm. And if you can capture the pattern, even though the painting is still and the image is not moving, the pattern speaks of the movement and sort of functions to animate the way actual movement animates. And an example would be Starry Night, an image most, most listeners would know, where um, how is Van Gogh creating this incredibly dynamic landscape without, and it's not moving, um, it's, it's in the, uh, the patterns that, are, that speak of movement. And that's kind of the way I think about it. So the, so the tree that's behind you, you know, there's so much curving and, you know, it's just been, um, there's just so much living that it portrays, you know, it, it's telling its own story of how it's lived and moved and all the yeah. patterning that's, that's there. Yeah, every, every twist, every turn is, is a movement or many hundreds of movements, yeah. That's a tricky thing. Great. Well, um, good. A really interesting question. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, and then uh, we do have um, one uh, one last question uh, comes from Kate, who says, "Hi, Adam. Thank you so much for the beauty you, you create. I so love seeing the progression of your work." How much time are you spending outside to paint versus time in the studio? Do you continue working on paintings after hours in the studio? And what is your process during the rainy season? Yeah, I think probably it's, it's almost three to one um, studio to outside, probably. The, um, it, sometimes I can go outside for two hours and really get a lot of information and then go back to the studio for four hours. So it's, it's mostly in the studio, but, um, but the outside part's really important. And um, the other question was the rainy season. Yeah, well, we didn't have much of a rainy season this year, um, unfortunately. Hopefully we've got more rain coming, but um, the days it's raining, I don't paint outside. <laughs> nice to see you here. <laughs> well, uh, Adam, this has really been a, a very enjoyable session. And um, I, I will just mention one last comment. My wife, uh, Connie, uh, reminds me to tell you again what I think I mentioned when I uh, first uh, was at your studio is that we have an amazing oak smack in the middle of our driveway. <laughs> and uh, how did it get there? We really don't know the full history of this really uh, silly house we're in that has uh, an, uh, an old heritage oak, beautiful tree in the middle of our driveway. But anyway, you're cordially invited to come and paint it anytime. <laughs> thank you, Connie. Thanks. I will yeah. do it. Anyway, I want to thank um, everybody for uh, who attended. Um, we so appreciate you participating in this program. We hope that if you enjoyed this and you want to encourage us and help us to continue free programs like this, um, it's very easy to make a contribution or to join the Museum of Sonoma County. Uh, we really, really appreciate your support. And um, all of us should hope and pray that we can open our doors uh, in, per in, in, in physical reality to the public in the not near too distant future and that um, we get through this pandemic um, before we all go crazy. Uh, and um, Adam, thank you so very, very much for sharing your work with us. Uh, it's really been a pleasure and we have lots of people clapping. Thank you. And um, Jenny and John, thanks so much for being our crew tonight. And um, everybody be safe, be healthy, uh, be creative, hang in there, 
and we appreciate you supporting the museum. Thanks and good night. Thank you. Good night. All Thanks. right. Take good care, night. everybody.